Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, machaba, mori mori wanji, namaste, jambo. Bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so delighted and so very honored that you join us in our mission to help all families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to tell all of your family and friends about the show. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Stitcher Radio, wherever you find your podcast. Join us right now from the beautiful town of Duxbury, just south of the studios here in Boston. Our guest is here today to celebrate her really fantastic Fenway and Hattie series of illustrated chapter books and middle grade novels. Please welcome to the show, Victoria J. Co. Hey, Victoria, how are you? I am great, Jedley. I'm so excited to be with you. I'm really excited to be with you too, Victoria. Victoria and I were just joking. Um, I asked there, there was a, a a picture that's that's hitting all the media sites here in Boston of somebody in her town parking in the wrong place, and the ocean came in and took their car their car out to sea. So a great reminder that sometimes you, you have to f- pay attention to those no parking signs. Absolutely. Yeah. So Fenway and Hattie, you were just sharing to me, this is a a, a really exciting series in that there have been probably millions of kids have have read this book around the country because it's one of those, 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 those series, those books that a school decides that everybody is going to read it together or a school district decides. Tell us real quickly all about Fenway and Hattie and why in the world there are so many schools and districts out there choosing to make this a priority for their kids to read. Yeah, so Fenway is a dog and um, Fenway and Hattie is about um, Fenway and his girl, Hattie, and they their family moves from the city to a suburban town where everything is different. And they both face a lot of challenges when they get to their new home. But the reader only gets Fenway's side of the story because the whole book and all of the Fenway books are told from his point of view. So the reader is only getting a dog's perspective. And so the reader has to kind of figure out what's going on with Hattie and the humans from their perspective. How are they dealing with their challenges at the new home? And I think that that makes it a lot of fun to read, especially for older readers, but even for younger readers, you know, to read it on a straightforward level from Fenway's perspective. He tells you what's happening and it's still really fun, but for those older readers and for the adults reading aloud, you can tell there's something else going on too. And I think that's why um, it is such a popular read aloud and such a popular all community, all school read because there's so much to talk about. There's so much fun. You know, most people like dogs, um, but also um, I hope and I think that people are having a lot of conversations about perspective. You know, can both sides of the story be right? And or, or does it just depend on who's telling the story? And I just think that whole idea of perspective is fascinating and fun, but also something that we all experience in our own lives. And I think at any age, it's not too it's not too early to think about that. I absolutely agree, and I think it's it's something we've talked about here in the podcast a lot. Just helping kids understand that we do have different perspectives and that we all are looking at different situations, different issues, different problems from a different lens that are in those lenses and those perspectives are based on our experiences, our knowledge, our age, you know, there, there are a whole bunch of things that go into it. And, um, 
if we can help our kids understand that and help our kids have empathy with the fact that people do have other perspectives and maybe there's a different way to look at this problem, I think everybody can be um, a little bit healthier and I, and I certainly think our communities would be healthier. A hundred percent. And what I think is so cool about Fenway and Hattie and all of the, of the Fenway books is that we're, we're learning that through a dog. You know, dogs are different from people, but dogs live with us. Most dogs live in our homes. And so they experience the same day to day in the same world that we experience, but they do it in a very different way. And so I think that dogs have so much to teach us. But also I find that it's very accessible, you know, even for very young kids to think about a dog's perspective. I mean, it's so much more challenging to try to think of a, another person's perspective, especially if they live in another country or they live in a different century or, you know, there's so many other ways that it can be very challenging to imagine someone else's perspective. But the takeaway is the same. The takeaway is that my perspective isn't the only one out there. And if I can learn that, and I did learn that at a very young age, and that's probably why I'm so fascinated with this idea, is that exactly what you just said, Jedley, it makes us better friends. It can help us be better community members. You know, it can just help us be more interested in other people and asking questions and listening. And I think that helps everybody. Yeah. Now, you mentioned that this is something that you learned at a young age. How, how did you learn this lesson? So I always go back to um, Beverly Cleary, who is my favorite author. Um, when I was a kid, I remember reading lots of Beverly Cleary books. And um, what was so fascinating um, about my experience with those series and those books is Ribsy. Because Ribsy is Henry Huggins' dog, you might remember. And he's in all of the Ramona books. He's in Ramona and Beezus. He's in all the Henry Huggins books. So I had read those books before I read Ribsy. Ribsy is a standalone title. And it happens to be written from Ribsy's perspective. And that kind of blew me away as a little elementary school kid because I thought I knew him. I knew him from those other books. But then I got inside his mind, you know. Beverly Cleary, does, she nails that dog's perspective. And I got to see Henry Huggins and the Huggins family and Ramona and Beezus and everyone on Clickitat Street from Ribsy's perspective. And that's what made an impression on me. And I, w I just became obsessed with that idea that everyone's perspective is different. And to this day, I'm fascinated. I love to read books from multiple points of view. I love to see or read a book um, from like an unusual point of view, like from the bad guy's point of view. Or, you know, um, I just love things like that or hearing a story told two different ways. I've just been obsessed with that idea ever since I was in elementary school. Yeah. Uh, Victoria, I'm really curious. Here we are. It's Patriots Day here in Massachusetts, and a baseball game has just begun at beautiful Fenway Park. What was it that inspired you to name the hero, the main character of your series, Fenway? Yes, absolutely. And I love that question. Um, so I don't know about you, but when my family was naming our dog, we named him after sports name because my family likes sports and, you know, we have so many favorite players and favorite teams and all of that. And I've noticed that a lot of people here in the Boston area do that. And when I was naming my character, I was thinking um, more about the people in the story because they would be the ones to name their dog. So you know, a pet's name says more about people than it does about the pet. And so I wanted to choose a name very carefully. And I thought, well, you know, my family chose a sports name. I think this family would do that too. Um, but then I thought, you know, the story is told from Fenway's perspective and he's a dog. So I have to put lots of clues in the text for readers to figure some things out because Fenway can't come right and out and tell them because he's a dog. So one of the things he doesn't know is where he lives. 
<laughs> and so I thought it would be a clue to the readers that the family lived in Boston. And the other reason I chose Fenway in particular is this was the summer of 2011 when I first started working on this character and this story. And here it is, 2023. You know, at that time, I was thinking, well, I want my book you know, to be around for a long time. And certainly, you know, 10 years into the future or, or beyond, I don't want this name to become irrelevant and, and I don't want the readers to, to not get it. And so that was why I chose Fenway. As you well know, Fenway Park is the oldest ballpark in Major League Baseball. It's more than 100 years old. And it's never changed its name, and it's never going to, which you cannot say about other ballparks or arenas. You know, many of them do change their names. And when I go into elementary schools now and I answer this very question, you know, sometimes I'm in a state or a city where they have a ballpark that has changed its name. And, and if I had tell them what was the name of their ballpark back in 2011, they don't even know because <laughs> they weren't born yet. So that's why Fenway was really kind of the ideal name. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. I, I want to talk to you a little bit. Now, now, Fenway and Hattie started as a middle grade novel, uh, and now it's available. At the, it's, it's, the, there are two series. One, is a, one series is a middle grade novel. The other is the illustrated chapter books. You were mentioning that you're really happy that the illustrated chapter books are available to kids. And, and talk a little bit about why that makes you so happy now. Oh, there's so many reasons. <laughs> um, first of all, I just have always wanted to write a book that was illustrated. I don't know about you, but I love reading books that have pictures in them. Um, no matter what kind of book it is, I love seeing the pictures. Um, and so that that's one reason. The second reason is that the illustrator, Joanne Lou Wrighthoff, is so incredible. I mean, she really done. I know you can see them, but, you know, she took the characters and the setting and the, the world and the stories that I wrote. And she really brings all the insights and humor and love into them, which is exactly what I would have dreamed of if I could have done that. But the third reason is. I think that the stories, which are the same, it's the same voice, it's the same characters, the same perspective, the same type of story. They're just simpler and shorter with only 10 chapters as opposed to 20. Um, but they're available. They're available to everyone. And so it doesn't matter if a young reader is in fifth grade or fourth grade or third grade they're available. You know, there are chapters, there are chapters, there's pictures. It's fun. It's funny. It's heartwarming. It's easy to understand. And then if they want to move up to the middle grade books, those are available too. But they're also available to kindergartners and first graders and second graders. And I also love them as read aloud alternative to picture books. Um, I don't know about you because I know you're also a parent, but when I, when my kids were that age, when they were four, five, six, seven, I read to them and, you know, reading picture books every night, you tend to just read them over and over again. I really craved those longer stories that we could spend a few nights on. But when they didn't have the long attention span, you know, they really weren't going to listen to The Hobbit, you know. And so um, I loved books like Fantastic Mr. Fox, for example. It's a chapter book, but it's not long. You know, it's just the right length so that a kindergartner um, can listen to it over three nights or four nights. And for the parent, too. I think that's so much fun, you know, being able to look forward to the next night, you know, what's going to happen. Um, and the same thing with elementary schools, our local elementary school here in Duxbury, um, not Alden, but Chandler is a K through two school. And last year when Fenway and the Bone Thieves was coming out, um, they read this as a read aloud to the entire school. And it only took them a week. And um, I just think that's so satisfying that, you know, you can start your story together on Monday and by Friday you've reached the end. And so it's very doable for younger kids. So those are all of the reasons that I 
love the chapter book series. Yeah. One of the things that, Victoria, you and I were speaking about before we started is that you, again, as you were just saying, that the, the, the illustrated chapter books are accessible to kids. And we know now that during the pandemic, not every kid received the help and support that they needed. Um, there's an expression uh, that I've heard um, is that you learn to read f- to you know from kindergarten to second grade, and then you read to learn third grade and beyond. And I think one of the unfortunate things is that there are kids who reach third grade and they're not ready for whatever reason to to read on their own, to read to learn. And a lot of those kids get left behind. Um, we had, um, uh, I love remembering that we had Malcolm Mitchell, a former New England Patriot, mm-hmm. who was a, um, mm-hmm. uh, a superstar athlete and, and a world champion, Super Bowl champion, arrived in college and at that time realized that he wasn't able to read. And the way he taught himself to read in college was by going back and finding picture books and illustrated um, chapter books and teaching himself to read. Um, Can you talk a little bit more about maybe some of the ways that we as a community can not only make sure that our kids are reading, are able to read to learn, but that we can make sure that all the kids in our communities can read to learn? Absolutely. I think one of the most important things that we as adults can do is not tell children what they can and cannot read. If a child wants to read a book and it might be, we might think, oh, that's too easy for you or that's not at your grade level. You know, that kind of just stifles the child's interest. And and that picture book or that, you know, easy chapter book might be just what they need right now. Um, You know, and I think that that's the most important thing is that if you love what you read, you can learn to love reading. And, um, you know, especially as the the point you were just making um, about kids who didn't get the support that they needed possibly during the pandemic. And we're seeing those children are now in fourth and fifth grade. And some of them may either struggle to read Or maybe they just don't like to read. You know, we used to call them reluctant readers, and I don't think we use those terms anymore. Um, But, you know, one of my very good friends um, told me a story right when the Fenway and the Bone Thieves came out, the beginning of the chapter book series, that really has stayed with me. And she had a son who was 10 years old at the time. And, you know, he didn't like to read, and he never would just willingly pick up a book but because she's my friend she went to the store and she bought Fenway and the Bone Thieves and he saw it lying around and on his own he picked it up and started reading it and she was amazed and she said you know it was because it looked fun it looked doable for him and he saw the pictures and the chapters are are not long and he felt this is doable like this is accessible I can do this and he got hooked on the the story the humor the character and he read the book and then he picked up the second book in the series and he read that one too and then after the sum it maybe took him you know a while to finish those books um but then he turned 11 he still wasn't willingly picking up books to read But then she said one day she saw him reading Fenway and Hattie, which is a much longer middle grade book, which doesn't have pictures in it. And he started reading it, too, because he was still interested in that character. And because he felt like he knew him, like I knew Ribsy, you know, he he said, well, I'm interested in this. I want to read it. And she said he never would have felt that confident before, but it felt approachable because he was familiar and that really spoke to me and since then I have told that story to so many teachers and librarians I even wrote about it for the nerdy book club blog post with the reading specialist Michelle Knott who was a good friend of mine and um, it really is something that that schools are seeing 
everywhere. It's not just my friend. And I think this idea of um, kids being able to grow in their reading skills and building confidence with the same character over categories, you know, a chapter book category up to a middle grade category, it gives them some extra support and encouragement, but it's not heavy handed. They are making their own choices and they are moving up as they feel ready. You know, one of the things that struck me as you were talking about why your friend's child chose to read the book and it was the the cover art was accessible and he liked it and the illustrations inside, but also the chapters weren't too long. And, and mm-hmm. I have to be honest with you, that's one of the th- one of the things I consider when I'm picking up a book. If I pick up a book and there's, you know, a chapter that goes thirty or forty pages, there's a real good chance I'm going to put that book down and not read it. I'm certainly and you're not alone. I have to tell you that I belong to um, a book group of adults, and these women and men, men in this group are very serious. We read very serious books. We have very serious discussions. It's not like a gossip group. It is like an academic book group. And when we're choosing a book, and it's 500 pages, people think, well, maybe we shouldn't read that one. (laughs) We should pick a book that's shorter. So it's not just you. I think um, for everyone, we want to feel, you know, not only interested, but we want to feel like, well, I'm willing to do this or I can do this. And that's all a part of it. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, you're mentioning 500, but I, I read Stephen King's, I think it was the stand, which is probably 30,000 pages or something ridiculous like that. And I look back and I go, I can't believe I got through that book. (laughs) And I know, and I know halfway through it, it was just like, well, I have to finish this book because all my friends know that I'm trying. Exactly. Exactly. But it shouldn't be that way. I do think Harry Potter changed that because those books were just so engaging. I mean, they were so engaging. And so for a while, the trend was for those long, even 700 page books. And those were mostly fantasy. Um, But I think we're seeing the trend now to much shorter books. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really curious. We do have a lot of authors who listen to the podcast and I'm sure they're sitting back thinking, I would love to hear that one school decided that everybody should read my book. And here you are, and you share with me that many, many schools have chosen for everyone to read your book in school districts. And even in at least one case, a whole state has chosen to read you. What's that like? What does that feel like when you hear, oh, the town of Duxbury decided everybody should read your book. What's, what's that like as an author? Well, I have to tell you, the first time it happened was in uh, December, January of 2017. So it's it was a while ago now. And it was unbelievable. Like, I never, ever, ever thought that that would happen to my book. At that time, it was my only book. And um, honestly, I was flabbergasted. But then it started happening again and again and again. And it was also chosen for the global read aloud a few months later. But um, it's honestly now, it's so many years into this, um, it's happening so much and so frequently. Um, I'm just amazed. Like every time it happens and the whole state of Texas, the whole state of Mississippi, um, you know, whole districts. I mean, and it also seems like... um, like wildfire, like one district in Michigan will read the book. And then it seems like all the surrounding districts are reading it too, or the following year, there's pockets all over the country where that's happening in Texas and, um, you know, North Carolina and just different places. I keep hearing from them or they contact me or I see them on tagging me on social media. But the truth is, Jed Lee, I don't even know most of the schools that are reading Fenway and Hattie, because unless they contact me, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, many of these schools also um, ask me to come visit, Mm -hmm. you know, following their all school read, which normally takes four or five weeks. And um, that then, of course, I, I connect and I get to visit the school either in person or virtually. Now it's mostly in person, which is my favorite. 
Um, but yeah, the whole school is decorated. They have activities, they have dog houses, you know, they might have a big squirrel tree in the entrance and, um, it's, it's kind of blows me away. There's a Fenway and Hattie song, there are Fenway and Hattie games, uh, teachers dress up. They might have a dog, um, therapy dog. I mean, all these things that they do, it's just really astounding. And, um, yeah, it's just really kind of incredible. Now kids are wearing Fenway hats. I mean, there's so much that happens. It's I, like, I've gotten used to being just kind of like amazed. It's just like, <laughs> it happens so often. It, and I, I really just never thought this would ever happen. But the more I talk to people who are decision makers, who, you know, get involved in a program like this and, and make it happen and why they chose Fenway and Hetty, I hear the same stories over and over again. Mm -hmm. You know, it is hitting that sweet spot that a kindergartner can understand it being read aloud. But it, it's challenging enough for a fifth grader because of that whole inference thing that we were talking about at the very beginning. And if I could say one more thing, Jedley, sure. um, when I was growing up, I was, a, well, little, when I was little, I was a huge fan of Pooh Bear. Pooh Bear is still my favorite character. All the Pooh Bear, the original Pooh Bear stories, the characters, all my favorites. I loved them. Probably somebody read them aloud to me. Um, and I still have the books and have a stuffed poo. Um, but when I became a mother, I read those stories to my own kids and I was like reading them on a completely different level. I was, there was no woozle. Those tracks they were following, they were really their own tracks, you know, and there was no heffalump in that pit. It was just Pooh Bear with the honey pot on his head. Like I didn't get that when I was a kid. But I still enjoyed the stories because I just believed everything Pooh Bear said, you know, and I believed Owl was really smart and I believed all of these things. But then I realized as an adult that those stories are written on two levels. You know, there's a whole storyline that you can understand through inference. And I didn't do this on purpose, but that's what Fenway and Hattie does, too. And so I think for those kindergartners, um, they believe Fenway. And everything that he says, they just accept it as fact. And they can still enjoy the story. But the fifth graders get it. You know, they get that Hattie is really trying to do something and Fenway doesn't understand it. So um, I think that's why it's hitting that sweet spot. And I think that's why schools are choosing it. And also, like I said before, they realize there's so much they can do with it. It's not just reading. There's so much that they can discuss. And there's so many awesome discussion questions that you can ask depending on the grade level of the kids. Wow. Well, I know people are going to want to know where they can go to find out more about Fenway and Hattie and also more about you. Well, um, my website would be the best place to do both. Um, and that is victoriajco.com. Um, I have um, a, an incredible amount of resources on my website. So I'll just leave it at that. Um, but I'm active on Instagram and Twitter at Victoria J. Co., um, where I post about reading and books and um, information for teachers. And I have a mailing list for teachers and librarians as well. And they can sign up on my website. We've had a great time speaking to the author of the, Vic the, the, <laughs> the Fenway and Hattie series. Our guest has been Victoria J. Co. Victoria, thanks so much for being with us. It's been a blast, Jedley. I am so excited that you invited me here. Thank you so much. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. And we hope that you'll join us for the next exciting episode of the show. To make sure you don't miss a moment of the show, please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Stitcher Radio, wherever you get your podcasts. Big thanks going out to my team, Fatima Khan, Rory Brady, Jordan Saley, Will Cheever, Cassandra Mason, and Stephanie Davila. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we all want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of The Reading With Your Kids Podcast. What? <laughs>